does your passion for composition and music come from? Like, do you grow up in a family of musicians? Um, well, I grew up surrounded by music. Um, you know, my immediate family, uh, there's a lot of musical talent, but there weren't professional musicians. It just was highly valued. So my dad's a great pianist. He, we always improvise together. Um, you know, my mom sings beautifully and she, she played piano and, um, my sister is a really good pianist, even though she didn't choose that as her profession. So I think, you know, my memory of being in the car, family gatherings, we we're always, um, playing music as much as listening to it. You know, on, it wasn't just listening on the radio. There's a lot of participation and, and playing. And so, um, for sure in the environment, it was, um, yeah. alive. And I think that when, um, you know, when it became clear that I really loved music and was always writing it, there was a lot of encouragement for me to continue doing that and developing it. Okay, I see. Uh, that awesome, awesome. So uh, the fact that you grew up like in that environment kind of draw you into then eventually comp composing for visuals. How do you got there into that decision then? I'm, I'm also a painter, I'm also a writer and a poet, and so I think the um, kind of cross-disciplinary uh, conversation is always happening in my own head, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I see it, things yeah. like The storytelling thing. The storytelling thing and uh, movement, just as a general vocabulary, like I always loved animation and, um, you know, I have as, as an adult, I haven't scored a whole lot of animation yet but just the the fact of music and movement together telling a story I think is just kind of in my bones um, and you know I think ultimately people who end up um, I guess people have different paths but I, I kind of felt like I uh, there's no escaping that I'm an artist <laughs> and so <laughs> it was uh, being in an environment where I was exposed to and could develop and get education um, definitely made it possible. I think ultimately what drew me is just, you know, my nature. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and I think with what I, there's something about music itself that I can't live without. So when I, um, you know, in in many of my developing educational years, I was always keeping uh, painting alive, video, writing, music, all. Um, and I think that just music is very compelling for me on a level that is, I just, uh, I need it to keep, I see you know, it. yeah. it's, it's part of uh, who I am in such a fundamental way. So it's a, a language that I need to speak every day. Gotcha. And I think, so, you know, for picture, uh -huh. um, yeah, we were just kind of saying that uh, I think I love, I found that when I worked in theater, I really loved to collaborate with directors and actors. Um, I found that very engaging. Even things like if I was writing a song, knowing the, sometimes knowing the singer who it was going to be sung by could sometimes be particularly motivating. I think the aliveness of working with people in, uh, who are storytellers in different ways was yeah. uh, a lot of fun. Um, and so I felt like, oh, I can, just in terms of the interpersonal experience, you know, you, you have the whole music team, the band, whatever the situation is. And also there's this other component where you're being invited in, kind of you're both a writer and performer, just not in words. So um, I, I loved having that be part of what I was asked to do in a in that context yeah I can definitely see that like I've been even having the opportunity to collaborate or being part of these different fields in the same industry like it's unavoidable you you get inspired somehow and as a storyteller as well like you just fill everything into then what you're doing as a composer for for your visuals and stuff like that's very interesting and I think um what I also felt was re really gratifying is that sometimes your music reaches people who maybe it wouldn't otherwise because yes. um, it's it's being delivered in the story. And actually, sometimes the 
story context makes people more open to more kinds of music mm -hmm. um, than they would normally listen to. So I felt yeah, like it's correct. this great vehicle musically too. Um, obviously, you know, there are, res there are limitations or boundaries that you're working with because of the story, but also I think mm -hmm. it, it frees people up in a way that, um, you know, maybe they might not initially put on a piece of music that sounds like certain pieces of score, but if they've experienced it in the story and it moves them, then their mm -hmm. mind is open to that kind of music. You know, so yes. it's just kind of I witnessed that happening. So that was cool. And, and I, I wanted to do more of that for that reason, too. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Great answer. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So the next question is related to the senior, the TV show. Um, How you got the gig? How was the process like when collaborating with the writers who you were who who were the person that you were? all the time, you know, getting feedback on, like, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. I mean, I think in television, the number one uh, point person is the showrunner, um, who's the writer and executive producer of, um, who's in charge of the kind of realization of the series, um, and is, uh, sees the series through from start to finish. So there are, there are a couple cases um, in in television where there will be one director for all the episodes. But in most television shows, including The Sinner, um, there are a few directors. Uh, that said, um, season one and season two now, the first couple episodes, first three in season one and first two in season two, um, were directed by Antonio Campos, who um, also participated in those kind of formative creative discussions. Um, Uh, so Derek uh, Simons is the showrunner for The Sinner, and he's actually a creative collaborator of mine going long, long way back. We met in, in college and, uh, you know, kind of kept our friendship and creative collaboration kind of developed over the years. We both ended up in L.A. and ha share a lot of um, uh, similar interests artistically. And so... Um, you know, we were happy to have the opportunity to work together in, you know, in this format um, when when this show became, um, you know, his next project. And um, so, yeah, so that's the basic architecture. Usually in a, a spotting session, you have, uh, you might have more than one of the producers in addition to Derek, um, Antonio in the early episodes, the editor, music editor, uh, me, Mm -hmm. So um, that's usually who's who's in the room and, um, you know, people who contribute to the the conversation. And, you know, final say is obviously the network. But in terms of the creative team, um, Derek is the leader of that crew. Gotcha. All righty. I see that. So we have the, the writers, the producer and. Well, I mean, um, the. In, in television, writing and producing is kind of, there are producers who don't write, but the showrunner okay. is, is uh, usually a, a writing producer. Okay. Um, cool. So. Alrighty. As a, you know, the, the difference is, I think, is, um, you know, in film, the writers rarely have input into something like mm -hmm. the music. Now, in this case, the writing team, the other writers are not in on those meetings. But the showrunner is actually the, the head of the creative team. So Alrighty. it's a little bit of a different emphasis in television. Derek is also a talented director, so it actually, you know, really yeah. works great because I think the show has kind of a cinematic uh, feel and we're going mm -hmm. for that. And, and I think that kind of the background of the people who are um, making decisions on the creative team have a lot of... Um, anchoring in film and so hopefully that comes across Alrighty. so in terms of instrumentation and production wise what was your mindset when developing the soundtrack and the music for the singer um well we um we wanted to create something that felt um contemporary um and uh kind of fresh in terms of the vocabulary so that you would not necessarily know what to expect um, and also something that could occupy a big emotional dynamic range 
um, mm-hmm. and stylistic range, which can range from, you know, spare chamber treatment to very um, layered electronic sound design yeah. uh, environments. Um, yeah. And where there's room for themes to emerge, melodies um, mm-hmm. that recur, but also a lot of atmospheric work too. So, yeah. you know, I think of it more as a continuum, a spectrum of mm-hmm. um, like kind of a, a zone of fields where the music lives rather than, you know, one linear approach. So it's kind of okay. fluid. And when it's appropriate for the music to sit back and support, it can do that. And then there are moments when, um, you know, a melody or theme can can come a little bit more to the forefront and help to tell the story in a different I way. I see that, of course, yeah. Um, I think that's yeah, always that's... always true of a score, um, but I think maybe we kind of um, hold both ends of the spectrum a little bit in, mm-hmm. in kind of the conceptualization of, of this score. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say exactly the same, like, it, it is your job not to just take the foreground. You, you gotta be always in the background stuff but you know making the things interesting like that's your job actually yeah right well yeah Yeah. and hopefully you know in a suspense thriller uh kind of situation um it's not so much about what they call like a jump scare it's more about the Mm -hmm. wondering the being on your edge of your seat uh not sure who to trust um Mm -hmm. you know so helping lead people along in in having the journey without uh Mm -hmm. giving them too much information just the right it's kind of like the writers they Uh have to give the right amount of information (laughs) yeah i see that and do do you guys have like any particular composer or band in in mind when you were like reference referencing to make the music because I was hearing a little bit of your soundtrack and some of the music and it really reminds me of the pop rock 80s stuff so do you guys just follow the style or you used um we didn't it, it was definitely not uh it was not a sound alike situation it wasn't like I was given um tracks oh it'd be great if it sounded like this it was it was okay, more okay. kind so of you got the uh, freedom yeah, but freedom. I mean, you know, we talked about more in terms of uh, textures or, I mean, we did have some temp references, but I guess I, I felt encouraged to kind of come up with something original. That said, we did, mm-hmm. you know, from the beginning, talk about having certain kinds of uh, very concrete and uh you know, recognizable synth textures, um, mm-hmm. you know, choosing those elements really um, carefully. And we didn't want it to be like a retro score, um, mm-hmm. but there are, you know, there's, so there, it's, it's less about kind of emulating a style, but, you know, mm-hmm. I think when you think about the like feeling, 80s, like yeah, but before, I think, yeah. yeah, yeah, but I also want to acknowledge that I think you know, the synth language of certain 80s um, score and and songs, um, you know, th- there are some textures in there which I think are relevant to that landscape, you know. Gotcha. I got you. All righty. So it's kind of, it's, it's like we didn't want to evoke, oh, it's this specific era. So it's, mm-hmm. it's a little bit of like, you don't want to go, it's not all about like just the that, past. Yeah. But um, kind of creating a blend where people feel like they have some anchor points and uh, okay. like kind of enjoyment zones, you know, like if something yes. feels mm-hmm. like yeah. it, it has a place to land in your brain. Um, but gotcha. also some new stuff that you're like, oh, that's not exactly mm-hmm. what I. Yeah, expect. that it still feels fresh. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. And what about the season two that we know that. It's coming, or when is it re- going to be released? Um, well, it's um, it's premiering on August first, so very okay. soon, actually. Um, I'm and I'm working on it right now. And what uh, and what can it, what can we expect? Here? Can we know a little bit about your job? Uh, job? Sure. I mean, I think I'm I'm looking 
the nice thing about the way the seasons are set up is it's an anthology. Um, you know, at first it was going to be one season and that's it. But since people responded so enthusiastically and they renewed it, um, it's basically that, you know, within each season, it's like its own story. So there yes, are things course. that continue, but it's also kind of, it's its own thing. So that said, there's going to be some continuity, obviously, because it's there. There are characters that continue. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Pullman's character is, you know, has a big part in season two. Kind of centers mm -hmm. around his um, his experience. Um, but also, there's a lot of new. I mean, the crime is totally new. They've shared the fact that it's a child um, who commits the crime. And so that's uh, its own, and the the setting is a little bit more rural. There are new environments, um, and so and thematically, just from like a literary perspective, there's there's new um, kinds of ideas. Um, so because of that, I'm kind of exploring new textures, and I'm just kind of at the beginning of that process. But mm -hmm. I have um, kind of working a lot with um, different instruments running through pedal boards and then undergoing further processing and um, kind of finding ways to uh, evoke those new environments. Gotcha. I see that. All righty. So we'll so see. I mean, it's so yeah. early that I don't know which which <laughs> of the instruments is going to be like, oh, that, that ends up being really important in the score of season two. We'll see because um, I'm just working on 201, episode one right now. Okay. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. So um, now let's jump into the field of uh, the women in the industry, right? Um, we know for sure like the, the presence of women in the industry right now is a little weak. So from your perspective, how do you feel women can develop even more presence in the scene? Well, I would, I would like to rephrase it. I would say the presence yeah, sure. of... The presence is strong, but it is mm -hmm. often un not acknowledged, um, and uh, we need more numbers, right? Um, okay. So I feel like the, I want to emphasize the strength part just because I think there are a lot of already excellent talents um, that, uh, you know, so it's a matter of kind of awareness of recognizing who who is there you know as well as cultivating um more participation and uh especially as like the next generation coming up like when the, the percentages are so low <laughs> in terms of the top grossing films and and shows that it's you'd think heavy lifting was involved that's what i usually say <laughs> it's like I think, you know two or three percent is very low it shifts around sometimes yes. a little up, a little down, but I mean, it's lower than directors. It's really the lowest and it doesn't yes. make any logical sense. So that I think just mm -hmm. points to, um, you know, very logically, like there must be some n not necessarily conscious forces, which are kind of um, limiting women's ability to advance within the field. But I think gotcha. that's, there are certain things I'm very, uh, feel very positive about that I think are starting to change and it's the kind of thing where since things are starting to change, we have to keep with it and keep the awareness up because it's not an overnight thing. It's a, you know, hopefully it'll be a, a quick change and improvement, but it doesn't happen overnight. But some of the things that I think are, um, you know, positive indicators, um, there's a new organization um, just a, a few years old called the Alliance for Women Film Composers. Mm -hmm. I'm actually on the board of that. Yes. Um, and they, they have a lot of great events, um, both for working composers as well as emerging um, young composers. Um, uh, there's a concert coming up, which I'm going to be a part of in Los Angeles, really big production called The Future is Female. Um, okay. It's going to happen at... Uh, uh, the will turn in uh, on September 4th and that's going to feature 12 composers, some more on the emerging side and some more on the established side. Um, and there's a really great lineup and it's all live. Uh, you know, it's going to be great big, you know, there'll be a big ensemble and 
um, soloists and, uh, you know, a, a really varied program. Um, so I think there are more events, kind of live events that are seeking to feature uh, women. Um, okay. And, you know, I think uh, one of the side benefits or good effects of some of these things is that they build camaraderie. Mm -hmm. So they build a network of resources. Uh, people might be like, oh, I need an assistant. I'm going to go to that organization and see who's, you know, if anybody's expressed interest, you know, like they have a little database there. Um, just in terms of thinking, oh, I, you know, I need somebody on my team and being more aware of who the women are who might be available to participate in that team. Because um, mm -hmm. I think in you know, a lot of, everybody has their own story about how they um, kind of got into the business. But a lot mm -hmm. of times, you know, participating on other composers' teams is part of that story. And so I think in the initial... Yeah, getting to know your community. Yeah, yeah and I think that, you know, um, yeah, so when, when more established composers are aware of the younger generation, the younger generation of women is more likely to get hired. And of course, the whole thing mm -hmm. of like, I think the live events and even interviews like this, like anything that increases visibility is great because then you really do have, you know, I think I feel lucky that even though I did not really growing up see any, <laughs> you know, I wasn't aware of Shirley Walker when I was growing up, one of the few female film composers in the um, previous generation. Mm -hmm. um, I just followed my artistic compass, you know, and mm -hmm. I, uh, I guess I, you know, partially the feeling of, uh, I think in some ways I was helped by a feeling of, you know, maybe I haven't seen or heard what I'm making before. <laughs> like I really value yeah. originality. Um, and a kind of authentic relationship to creating something new when I'm working. And so I didn't think, oh, I'm going to see that outside first, you know. Yes, <laughs> and I think yes, as yes. just as an artist, um, yeah. you know, I kind of, there's so much, uh, of course, like the number of influences is huge because there's so much amazing music from all over the world. And then mm -hmm. when it comes to actually creating my own compositions, like I, as an artist, I always valued that kind of... Um, going within and listening for something new now that I've absorbed all this stuff, what, what do I have to say? And I think yes. as a result, um, even though it is, it was often depressing to see that there's no women out there, I felt, you know, well, as an artist, I'm looking to make something new. So uh, it prepared me a little bit to negotiate yes. that kind of environment where I didn't necessarily see myself out there you know, reflected in a role model. Mm -hmm. But I yeah, think that yeah. for many people, um, it can be the factor that determines whether or not they feel like there's a place for them, um, which is, artists are very sensitive often, I think. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if people have different options, they might choose an option where they feel like they're going to be welcome. So I think, you know, hopefully... Mm -hmm. The efforts to kind of raise awareness of people who are working. There's like a lot of kick-ass women who are actually doing the job now. And the numbers will increase, I think, just by literally, you know, each of those women showing up to work and giving interviews and doing concerts. And, um, you know, and I think that on the hiring side, there are certain executives who, you know, I think do get it. So it, it takes time and um, but I, I think that people want to work with talented people, you know, and so mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of talented women. And so it's changing. It is changing. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So much wisdom in that answer. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, well, to kind of wrap up everything, um, what about if you tell us three elements for your persona that you feel helped you? to open new doors when you started your career? So I think one is definitely, we kind of touched on, which is that um, feeling of, uh, you know, I guess confidence in my, my own... Uh, my intuition, you're very intuitive too. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> uh, yeah, feeling like I, I knew that I have a lot to say musically mm -hmm. and as an artist and uh, trusting in that. That, I think, is the heart of everything that we do. You know, even though there's a lot of uh, commerce involved in the industry, for sure, and it's a profession and there's a, a lot of kind of... Uh, administrative and business and managerial components to the job, I think the heart of being a, a composer for picture is your artistry. So I think the confidence that I have always felt in, um, in my voice and what I have to give um, mm -hmm. helps, you know, because yeah. you can, um, I think, for example, people may not be aware uh, various aspects of what you can do that that's kind of I think true for many working artists um, mm -hmm. you know people are looking in terms of composition oftentimes people who are in a hiring position will um, kind of listen almost like they're at the supermarket and they're like I want action music and so they'll go shop for that from the <laughs> shelf and like then they might not realize that certain composers would be really great collaborators and create a great score for their film because um, they're just not so aware of it. So this is going to turn into a little piece of advice for people, but I mean, I think that if people, just like with comedians and actors and, you know, a lot of times, sometimes people need to uh, create the work to demonstrate what they can do. People aren't mind readers, so, you know, uh, people have to kind of represent themselves. Obviously, um, new projects bring out aspects of you that um, are unique to that project, but you can also, in your spare time, this is for like the emerging composers, just create mm -hmm. stuff that you would like to you would like to get hired for. I mean, it's kind of yes, obvious yeah. advice, but it's worth repeating. Um, so back to good qualities. Um, I think. Um, you know, enjoying the collaborative process for sure. That's mm -hmm. in terms of composing yeah. for picture, that's what it's about. So I love writing pieces and songs for their own sake. Um, but I'm also all in to the collaborative process when I'm scoring a film or TV show, right? That's okay. kind of, um, it's not a side note that it's collaborative. It's like mm -hmm. the big headline. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that I enjoy that. And so that that has definitely helped um, me mm -hmm. in my career development because it's I think it's so important. And, and in terms of the people who are working with you, that's they want a collaborator. Yes. Um, somebody yeah. who's listening, uh, mm -hmm. listening and speaking. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and. I don't know. Third quality, I think, sense of humor is good to have. <laughs> <laughs> to balance. <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I was saying, you know, in some ways, whatever the stresses of the job may be on a deadline, it's like, it's, uh, it's all, we're playing in the imagination. I mean, we're lucky to be doing something which is impacting people on the level of emotion and thought, but it's... Um, the, the stakes are ultimately not that, I mean, there are jobs where the stakes are very, very, very high. <laughs> and it, yeah. I, I think that it's kind of a privilege to have a, a job where we get to um, play, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I like to keep my sense of humor about whatever is going on because um, Whatever it is at the end of the day, it is uh, it is playtime for adults. So yes. yes, yes, I like that. I really like that. My favorite advice was that. <laughs> well, that was it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for much so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I know for sure that all your our community, all our members, will be super excited of all the things that you just shared with us. So thank you. <laughs> 